Welcome to Front and Center, from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. Hello, I'm Michael Maxetti. And before we introduce our guest, let me introduce my partner, Steve Berriman. Steve, take it away, please. Thank you, thank you. And yes, we're very pleased today to have as our guest, Joan Blades. She's the co-founder of Living Room Conversations. It's an open source effort to rebuild respectful discourse across ideological, cultural, and party lines while embracing our shared values. She's also co-founder of MoveOn.org and Moms Rising and the co-author of The Custom Fit Workplace and the award-winning Motherhood Manifesto. Welcome, Joan. Hi. Hi there. Great to be here. Good. Well, you know, you and I met, I'm trying to remember when. I think it was probably about 10, 12 years ago. We met through our mutual friend, uh, Joseph McCormick, uh, transpartisan uh, pioneer, and I think we went for a hike or two in uh, Children Park in Berkeley together. I think it's really important for people to hear uh, a little more about your story. How was it that you went from moved on, Move On, which was uh, a very partisan organization, to wanting to participate or create something like the Living Room Conversations? Well, a lot of people have forgotten that Move On started back in '98 around the time of the Clinton impeachment scandal. And about six months into it, my husband and I wrote a one sentence petition, Congress must immediately censure the president and move on to pressing issues facing the nation. Because it just seemed like we were getting way too polarized and it was not helpful. And you could love Clinton or hate Clinton and agree that was the best thing to do. And we actually had you know, thousands and thousands of Republicans signed that petition as well as Democrats. I am a, a mediator by origin and inclination. So that the origin of Move On was actually quite unifying. What happened was after a flash campaign that communicated with millions of voters and got out the vote and pundits agreed that the impeachment was not popular, the House voted to impeach. And when the House voted to impeach, we just engaged hundreds of thousands of people in politics many times for the first time in their lives. And good citizens work to elect people that represent their values more. That's when we got hooked in for a longer term engagement and those people were you know that wasn't okay and so at the point we got involved in elections that is an adversarial pro process and move on became very strongly associated with the, the democrats at that point i will also note that i live in berkeley i was born in berkeley and <laughs> being on the left comes kind of natural to me but I've always um, wanted to have good relationships with people that have different viewpoints. So how did this uh, living room conversations emerge? How did you, how did you actually uh, create the connections to, uh, to have that kind of a platform? And what, what made you wanna to go to the living room conversations? Well, actually it was back in 2004 that I met Joseph McCormick um, and I was very interested in helping with reuniting America. And that was an effort to get leaders on the right and left together to talk. And I was particularly interested in why there was such a different viewpoint about climate change on the right and the left. And it gave me an opportunity to really make some friends with very different, you know, political backgrounds than I had. And I thought it was valuable. By 2008 or 2009, it was less possible to have a good conversation about climate change with someone on the right. And my experience at Move On persuaded me that grassroots engagement around allowing people at the community level to really connect 
is the foundation of a good democracy. So Living Room Conversations is a effort to make it possible for anyone that wants to have a good conversation to have a good conversation with people that they don't necessarily agree with. And it's they're structured in such a way that it's really a listening practice. And it's a great way to start to come into the space where you grow connection and understanding. And from there, good things can happen. It's interesting that right at this time, we seem to be in the midst of two seemingly very contradictory trends. Probably things are more polarized even now than they were 12 years ago, hard to believe. And yet there seems to be this impulse coming from uh, uh, as yet to be defined center that wants people to come together beyond these divides and work together to solve problems rather than stay on the battlefield. So you seem to be right in the middle of that of that conversation. How do you see, uh, I mean, we all know what the causes of polarity are, but I would like to get a little bit of your perspective on that. And then also um, how we can, uh, the hopeful signs that, that we actually are going to be able to find uh, these common values and common center? Um, in terms of, yeah, it's definitely more polarized now than it was way back when. Yeah. I'm, I never believed it could get this bad, honestly. And I'm deeply concerned. When I started talking about living room conversations, I was talking about how important it was for us to be able to work collaboratively because you need everyone's best ideas in the room and you need the agility that comes with being having good relationships and being able to talk something through and change things, it's things that are working, you stop doing things that are good, you do more of. And when you're in perpetual conflict, that doesn't happen. I started talking about it as peace building hmm. about four or five years ago, which is you know, not, not how I was originally thinking about this, but you know, people from outside this country, people that do look at societies that fall apart are starting to look at us with concern. And that's deeply troubling. You know, when we start seeing other people as less than in some way, we are losing our capacity to be with each other and you know, respect the dignity of everybody. That is at the core of this practice. And when you talk about the folks in the middle, I, I'm not sure I even call it the folks, in, the people in the middle. They're people throughout the political spectrum that hold that space that we have to be treating everyone with dignity. And I can be, you know, on the left and whatever, I, and still really care deeply for someone that has very different viewpoints. Since when have we not been able to do that? And it's interesting that you call it peace building because I've, I've had the joke, you know, if we want peace in the Middle East, we have to first create peace in the Middle West uh, <laughs> with, with the people that we're a little bit closer to. And, you know, people who talk about, well, these two, two groups in Israel and Palestine sitting down at the table and talking to one another as it's become more difficult. Um, so, um, Michael, I think you probably have some questions regarding uh, how this um, living room conversations work. Yeah, I do. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Joan, you just mentioned something about treating everyone with dignity, and that is so crucial. But when, as you mentioned just before that, about once we've gotten to a point where everybody is othering the others, dehumanizing the others, it makes it nearly impossible when you do that to treat them with dignity. Otherwise, you wouldn't be dehumanizing them. You wouldn't be othering them. So how do you see from your perspective, and I really have to ask this question, I really do want to get into some of the specifics of living room conversation because I think you have a, a wonderful organization there and uh, that's grown immensely. 
But before that, how do you see us getting to do that, to treat others with dignity? What would be the, the, the acorn that would grow into a tree and help us do that? I think these, the commitment to respect and listening leads there very rapidly. Once you start to have relationships across differences, you begin to perceive how that impression that people are more extreme than they actually are is, is really true. And as you start to care about people with very different viewpoints, you start to generalize that too, because we become increasingly homogenous in our communities. We become even fearful to talk to people with different viewpoints, at which point when a bunch of people that agree sit down to talk about something political, they come away from that conversation more self-righteous, more sure that everyone else is idiots. And this is not helpful. What, it's you know, or evil or evil. Yeah, or evil. There's just so many ways that we, uh, you know, put people into buckets of being somehow different and not worthy. And, you know, I hear people say too often, why would I want to talk to them? And that is a problem because we are in our community locally, but also nationally. And as that division has grown, it's causing some very ugly things to happen at both the national and the local level. So, you know, the very interesting thing about COVID is it's caused new divisions I never imagined would happen but it's also caused us to be comfortable having conversations like we're having now, really personal, on video. So we've got tens of millions of people that can connect across the country if they choose to. So there are, you know, there's sibling cities that are being uh, encouraged. And I was just talking to the Rotary Peace Group last night and they're saying, oh yeah, we have rotary clubs all around this country. We've got churches, we've got libraries, we've got bookstores, we've got bakeries that are doing living room conversations on a monthly basis. And some of them are saying, okay, now I'm ready to talk to, you know, we have a San Francisco, Arkansas faith community group. And that's two different worlds. <laughs> There are all sorts of choices, and it's fun. You know, uh, we always look very serious about this, but it's actually really fun meeting people. And well, let me stop you here and ask you, for those in our audience to be, and those who will be hopefully watching this, one of our main goals is to help bring to these new people an understanding that, of this process that's available to them. Because so many people ask, "What can I do?" And a in a great starting place would be to go to and engage in a living room conversation. For somebody who knows nothing about that, would you kind of give a brief intro to somebody? What is living room conversations? How does it work? Living room conversations are open source. You have over a hundred conversation guides on a wide variety of topics. There's six people classically, sometimes there are four or five. Don't encourage it to go much over six because the intimacy is what makes it really gratifying. And when you talk about, oh, it's only six people, you have to remember because these are self-facilitated, it starts with a set of conversation agreements about respect curiosity, taking turns, kind of what you learned in kindergarten, right? <laughs> Everyone's very good at this. They read it and go, oh yeah, I could do that. Um, 
we could have 10,000 or 100,000 conversations in the weekend if people chose to do it. So yes, they're small, but they're also massively scalable. And you know, having had the move on experience, I have seen viral moments. And what I hope to see at some point is people to say, enough, <laughs> this is not good. We are going to have to be in right relationship with other people around us. There's a documentary that came out last year called The Social Dilemma that digs into how our media and way too many leaders are constantly tapping into our fear, our anger, and our anxiety because that's what gets shared most readily. And that is not good for us and it's not good for our relationships. We have to intentionally own where we want to be with our relationships and make this change. That's great. For those who are watching and aren't familiar, some of the topics uh, that they have and they have by category, and there's, as Joan mentioned, over a hundred, the American dream category, culture and society, education, the environment, faith, family and community, and it goes on. There's uh, values, connection and COVID conversations, conversations about talking about politics, talking about race, talking about all kinds of things. Uh, and for those who are concerned a little bit, there are conversation agreements that everyone has to agree to to start the conversation. And I'll just briefly, the key ones are be curious and listen to understand, show respect and suspend judgment, note any common ground as well as any differences, be authentic and welcome that from others, be purposeful and to the point. Uh, so that's just a little bit more for somebody who doesn't know to hopefully invite them to go to your website, which is, Joan? Livingroomconversations.org. Thank, Thank you. And there is a little button there where you can join. And if you do that, once a week, you'll get a note that tells you about new conversations, conversations that you can just join online, upcoming trainings, because some people like to have host training. Uh, we have some hosts that have been trained and are super skilled and like going into the tougher conversations. A lot of communities like having, starting with some of the values conversations where they find a lot of common ground. And then they will choose things that are increasingly challenging, but really deep. There's an evangelical community that was doing the monthly and things got overheated on Facebook and they chose to have the guns and responsibility conversation that month. And it was remarkable because I got to kind of hear about one table because I had a, I had a connection there. There were two men that were ready to die for the second amendment right, right at this table and a woman that had, had been traumatized not once, but multiple times because of guns. And what happened was a conversation where they just really listened to each other and came to appreciate why these men had such affection really for guns. It was part of their connection to their fathers and their, with their kids and, you know, it's, and how guns had impacted her life and they came away with a lot more appreciation for how these different viewpoints were important to people and they cared and it they took it out into their lives. I do hope people will go to your website because you have a you've you're, you've evolved since you've begun and it's grown immensely it's wonderful and it's so robust and you go into great detail and there's examples there for people to get into, explore, to find a topic that they would be interested in. Uh, you know, when you first shared with me, when we first met nine years ago in October, 2012 in Seattle, uh, and you shared with me what you were thinking about, I was thinking, how in the world, one by one, can that grow to any substantial amount? I, I was kind of 
And here it is these years later, and it's grown immensely. Uh, and it's wonderful because it is such a great starting point. So I encourage anyone uh, who's looking for something as a place to start, I highly encourage them going to Living Room Conversations because it's, it's great. You've done a great job with it. And you have a great team as well. Thank you. Well, I guess the other thing I'd say is we started around polarization. And very soon we had some race conversations too. And when George Floyd was killed, those conversations multiplied. You know, we had probably have a couple dozen conversations that touch on different aspects of race. Um, and with COVID, we have a whole set of conversations about values and connections. We were already having values conversations. And sometimes I think for a polarized situation, in some ways, the values conversations are the best possible starting place because you don't need to start with something hot. You can start with a place where you just talk about your you know, purpose, trust, forgiveness, hope. We have all those conversations and they, they have led me to have a better understanding of my own values, having these conversations which always kind of surprises me because I figure I'm old enough. I've thought about most of these things. But no, when I sit down and I'm with five other people with different viewpoints, it causes me to be able to understand even myself better. Steve, and, and I know you've got a lot of good questions to ask too. And, I, and let me ask one more before I... No, go ahead, go ahead. Don't, You're on a roll. You talk about respectful to rebuild respectful civil discourse while embracing our core shared values and and that is something you've been talking about and demonstrating throughout your life but now with living room conversations what have you found to be those i know you articulated just now a few of those but what are those through the conversations and through this process uh could you say those to be those shared values, those core shared values, what would they be? You know, we have a lot of core shared values. We all want purpose and need purpose. Fairness is something almost everyone values. Absolutely. And kindness. People want to be kind. I, I have been asked to write with others, a conversation about love. Okay, you have that. It's going to very basic parts of humanity. Forgiveness. You know how? What is our relationship with forgiveness? What? What is forgiveness even? Do we want to? When is it appropriate? When is it not? How? There's a lot to unpack in these simple <laughs> terms. Mm -hmm and our own personal relationship with the trust or forgiveness or hope kind of sets a, a foundation for ourselves too. Thank you, thank you. Steve, I'll shut up for a few minutes. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's good. You know, uh, one of the things that you mentioned, uh, John, was, the, was so, the social dilemma. And uh, the forces that are that are seeking to pull us apart. And the other thing you mentioned was one of the things that COVID brought to us is the magic of Zoom, and the magic of being able to connect with people all over the country. And and the thought and dream that I had is um, a, a much more scalable conversation where people uh, in this country can circumvent uh, the media and have face-to-face -face conversations with one another uh, at the scale of really talking about, uh, about the values that we share as a country and perhaps ways of unifying around those values and even collaborating around those values to build more of what we want rather than devolve into arguing about what we don't want. So have you thought, I, I, obviously this is a very successful project. Anything that's still going, after almost a decade 
and growing. I looked at your staff. There's more people on the staff than there was last year. So I'm seeing that this is really a, a growing endeavor. How do you see this scaling happening and, uh, and really convening a, a conversation that avoids and supersedes the social dilemma? <laughs> well, the reason this is open source is so that people can use it in their lives the way that it works. And we want, you know, we want everybody to own these conversations. I actually love the social dilemma because our technology and relationship conversation, it's the difference that's most interesting there is not right, left, it's age. You know, you got a teenager, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. The way our technology impacts our relationship, technology and relationships, very different depending on when, when you got into the world of technology. And it allows us to think about whether we own our technology or it owns us and to make some choices. <laughs> so I think that you know, the whole country needs to be having that conversation and might be motivated to, honestly, at some point here because there's all sorts of uh, research, research that suggests we have loneliness at a level that we haven't seen before. We have mental health issues that are you know, way up. And there's, a, there's this thing where we're connected, but it's not in a way that's fully satisfying for a in-person human being, <laughs> it's like, hmm. and the interesting thing is we have um, done a research project with Fetzer over 18 months, started in 2019, that found that both the in-person and the video conversations provide the short-term and longer-term impacts we're hoping for in terms of gaining conversation skills and nuance, and, which is pretty amazing. Um, but I, you know, I can tell stories from the last couple of years where, you know, one mom got to know her nephews in a way she never had, would have otherwise, and her mother who lived in another state was saying, when can we have another of these conversations? So she got to take care of her mother and her mother's friend and get to know her nephews better and kind of keeping the family connected and taken care of. So technology can be wonderful when used in a way that serves us. And if we don't pay attention, we become its tool. Yeah, I think that's really what the question is, isn't it? Who's in charge of, is it in charge of us? And I think a lot of what's going on right now uh, with, with the COVID conversation is really concern about uh, this monopoly and top-down uh, imposition of narratives and so on, that I think uh, it exacerbated all of the divisions that were already there, and made it you know made it seem more urgent, to, you know, to the, the guy with the uh, who would you know die for his die for his Second Amendment rights and so on, the the fears that have been um, generated by what's been going on and the very different approaches to uh, what personal freedom is and all of that. Is there a way to actually overgrow that and find, uh, and find common ground above and beyond that very deep divide? That's a very tough one right now because people have lost loved ones and they've you know, lost a lifestyle there's a lot of losses involved with that. And it's, um, it's something that's also very tied to kind of showing your team colors. So many complications. We kind of, the trust conversation is probably the starting conversation for that because we've got to have, you know, start to build some trust to be able to get to the destination we need. 
it's this is not a one conversation challenge we're facing. <laughs> yeah. Very Joan, clearly. Joan, you mentioned uh, technology and asked the question, do we own it or does it own us? And that is a conversation, as you mentioned, that is absolutely essential to be had by all, uh, per particularly the millennial generation and the, and the Gen Xers and those, because their life, they're going to be living it while, and I'll leave it at my generation, even though I know we're <laughs> all in the same, pretty close. Uh, so the that conversation is so crucial because there's so many people right now that are excited about this transhumanism and how they see the the fun and and benefits only of what these some of these new technologies can do and they're not aware of the unintended consequences perhaps and or how it can be used by some to control and oppress others and all you have to do is look to what's been going on in china since 2017 when they introduced these new levels of technology and now they have the social rating and your freedoms are directly tied to your uh, obedience to their rules. Um, and what I wanted to, to bring up is it would be important for anyone watching this who wants to look at this question. I encourage them to, to watch on Netflix of all places, which had Social Dilemma, which was a great starting place. Watch that and we'll link that up on the bottom of the show notes, but also to watch Black Mirror now, Black Mirror is 22 episodes, but it clearly takes us to some of the unintended consequences of this new level of technology. Uh, it's called Black Mirror. And the new show that's just gotten all the rave reviews that so many young people are watching, and I finally watched it after so many of my friends' kids told me how they loved this, was Squid Game. And Squid Game is, a, a again, an advancement of the use of technology, and it's also an advancement of the story of the Hunger Games, Hunger Games, uh, to a new level. I've also had some people describe it as violence porn. Yeah, I think you can have a narrative that's got value, but then it's coupled with something that <laughs> I really object to. <laughs> so yeah. I have not watched it. Have you watched Black Mirror, by the way? No. I encourage you to go watch. Now, that's there are some that I mean, I literally there was a couple of episodes I had to turn off. I couldn't. I was so uncomfortable watching some, but most of them are not. Some of them are very innocuous, and, and they're all like the Twilight Zone. If, uh, each episode is uniquely different, takes on a totally different aspect. I encourage you to go watch a few of those uh, at least, and uh, and share that with people. S Steve, did you have the because I could go on. I got some other questions here. Well, I would. Uh, I think we we want to talk more about about you know one of the things that's that's been happening uh, in these conversations. You're you're number seven of our conversations, and through some uh, intuitive whatever, the conversations seem to build on one another. And uh, you're following uh, 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 conversations about indigenous people. You're following conversations. Uh, Tom Hartman uh, did a very articulate presentation on what he calls the lost people, uh, which has to do with the fact that uh, the the uh, you know white folks from Europe have little or no connection with their own indigenous past, and so there's much that's been lost uh, that's that's probably enabled us to be. Uh, so focused on technology without the wisdom, the deep wisdom that comes from being grounded in the earth and so on. And uh, I, it, so this is a conversation about, uh, we're now coming to the point where all of our collective trauma, you know, it seems like everybody is suffering from uh, either a mild to serious case of PTSD. And uh, this collective trauma is coming up for for healing, and I know Michael had some uh, questions about about that. I know that you've been uh, you you've been uh, thinking about that as well, and the uh, 
the adverse childhood events that lead to so many problems in adult life. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? I don't feel like I have expertise mm. to, I, I think there's some adverse childhood experiences inform a lot of schooling needs, you know, resilient schools, medical issues. You know, it's, it's got a profound impact on individuals. The place where the conversations intersect with this is as we try to change communities, dynamics, it's a way to invite in missing voices. Mm. There's one school in Walla Walla, Washington that did a, just an amazing job of creating a resilient school that was a great place for kids that had had a lot of trauma. And having that school replicated has not happened at a large scale at all. You know, we have good ideas and good outcomes at various places, and then it doesn't get replicated. And systems are very hard to change. Human beings hold on to what is what they're used to much more tightly than you would think. Even when they're not working great, change is scary. So I like to believe that these conversations are one way to help get the missing voices in, get people starting to think about the issues that need to be thought about, but then they would need to move on to a facilitated process. The conversations are part of change, changing systems, but they are not the lead changer. It's, it's a wonderful entryway. Mm. Okay, um, where do you see the most light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, that's not a car coming the other way. Uh, <laughs> where do you, where do you, because uh, you've been doing these, I know that there's stories that have inspired you, um, but in the midst of, of all of this um, uh, difficulty that we're facing right now and challenge, what is it that, uh, that makes you go, I think we can make it? This last year or so, I've been seeing that leaders in all sorts of different positions are finding the conversations useful for achieving their ends. For, you know, libraries, conversations are a great way for them to support the community, build the community, create more connections in the community. And libraries have been redefining themselves, right? Faith communities, faith communities, the core values of faith communities are about, you know, human dignity. You know, it's, in fact, the language I think I like the most is, you know, we have to see the divinity in everyone. And that's a place where sometimes the congregation is quite diverse and they need to first make the connection with each other and then they can expand that to the larger community they're in. And then some of them may choose to expand that to across the country because they see that the country also needs this kind of work. Clubs, Rotary, uh, there's just, when leaders take it and run with it and when it becomes a school systems, when it becomes embedded in other organizations, I think that's the way it's going to really be able to help heal and begin the process of getting us back into a place of a good relationship and trust. Prior to the election, I worked with the Peace Alliance to uh, promote a, an agreement that had right-left pairs condemning a violence around the election. And 
violence is local. You know, so if you can create a local container that says we don't do this here, that's highly effective. And I think we need to do that, create a lot of local containers of we all belong here. And we are making this a community that is the kind of place that we all want to live. This, that's the tool that I dream this is. And as our, commu as our smaller community becomes more and more healthy, then it will see how it's connected to the community adjacent and adjacent. That's my light at the end of the tunnel. That's a nice beacon. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to help bring forth is to get people aware that to envision the world that they know is possible. Uh, Charles Eisenstein says it so beautifully, with the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. And when people begin to think in the positive terms, what we can make of how do we want to live? What are those shared values that we all share? But how do we want to live? Then you start making decisions that will move us in that direction. Uh, and that's so important. And these conversations, as part of that, when people start to, to think about and talk about what is the kind of world they want to live in, uh, that'll help us move away from allowing the kinds of decisions to be made that are taking us away from a place that we know is possible and that we want to live in because we can look around and see the trauma uh, and, the, and how most people have to live. Um, so you're offering a nice, a nice path uh, and a beacon that's important. Yeah, I'd like to go back for a second on something that, that Steve had asked about and you had brought forth to me, which was ACEs, and that's the adverse childhood experiences. And that research that the CDC in conjunction with Kaiser, you brought sent to me back in 2012. And I've been following that development of ACEs and how that's been implemented. And this understanding of trauma, I think is one of the crucial things that can help in these conversations uh, that, that Living Room Conversations is having and all of us need to have and are having is that understanding of our shared trauma. And that's where the story that Steve alluded to called The Lost People that we brought forth uh, with Tom Hartman is that understanding that all cultures, all cultures have gone through horrific periods uh, in their evolution and their history. And it's from a position of understanding that the and he had the, the firsthand experience with the half Aborigines where that half, ab, half Aborigines person was, he asked, don't you hate those white people that did that to you? And he says, no, because what they did to me had been done to them by others. And that this issue of violence, people perpetrate violence because violence had been done to them. They've been taught that, that's their way of, of dealing with difficult situations. And that's where this issue of, of our shared trauma can help us lead out of that continuation of this violent period, this period of separation and help us say, wow, we've all gone through and have this shared trauma. Now let's, let's have a time, let's, let's come back in reunion and accept each other. And that's one of the ways that we can begin to look at each other with dignity is to realize that you're doing to me or what has been done to you or your ancestors. And that's burned into our DNA and passed down from generation to generation. And now it's time we can change that. <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to add one thing to that because it, it, when you were describing, Joan, the, the way that the conversations unfold, if we look at how things happen on social media, um, all of the uh, frustration and emotions seem to be channeled into anger when there are other emotions like fear and most importantly, grief. And obviously in these face-to-face, heart-to-heart conversations, these emotional nuances like the grief that people share 
which is, you know, as important as the joy that people share. Have you, have you found that those emotions uh, get aired as well that kind of fill in the picture a little more? If you're talking about the living room conversations, yeah, I would say yes. I mean, it's the conversations are structured so that you read the agreements together and you've got an understanding. And the first round is fairly short and just an opportunity to answer one of three questions that tend to lead you to talk about some of your deeper values. The second round is the heart of the conversation, the topic you have chosen. And when you're asked those questions, it's about your personal relationship with that topic. And so that's where, you know, you end up talking about a lot that we have a whole set of conversations about loss in the COVID conversation set. Mm -hmm. And the final round is just a reflection and next steps. It's, it's a simple model, but it's profound. <laughs> we really, I'm just kind of struck again and again by how powerful it is to show up and really listen to a group of people that see things very differently and to appreciate it. Listening is the most, probably the most important place to start. A lot of people come away from this practice and what they have to say is that it changed their way of relating outside of the living room conversations. It gave them more skills. Steve? Well, that's really excellent. Uh, the only other uh, the only other question is also kind of a future paced question. And that is that <clears throat> once the this may not be the department of, of the uh, of living room conversations, but I, I think it's sort of the next step. And that is that once people come to rehumanize one another and recognize that there are shared values, even though there are different ways of getting there, um, can, have you seen uh, kind of collaborations emerge where people recognize the importance of coming at some of these divisive issues from the different points of view. Has that emerged at all yet? I have been part of one initiative that started out of a living room conversation around criminal justice reform. Honestly, we don't, we don't have the full vision of things happening. Though I have heard of, yeah, I have heard of things happening in all sorts of places, but I have little snippets from, you know, sometimes it's because of a relationship that started and then it just continues. So around the country, yes. And I can't give you a great story except my own personal one, which was, you know, when I co-hosted a conversation with the co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots, uh, he and his friends and you know, my friends, we had so much agreement around too many people in prison, the war on drugs is not a success, got to find evidence-based practices that we ended up being able to um, contribute both in a public way, but also the, it was a seed for a group called the Coalition for Public Safety. So that was kind of amazing. You traveled That's around. a great story. Thank you. <laughs> you traveled around the country with, with Mark Metzger, right? Uh, Mark we did meet and go to a, a couple of things together. Yeah. Yeah. You've done a series with John Grable with... Uh, John Gable. Gable with yeah. the uh, All Sides. Can you share with us some of, some of those experiences and what brought you guys together and, and what was the genesis behind that? Sure. Um, I met John Gable in Colorado years ago as part of the bridging movement. I met John Gable years ago in Washington, D.C. at a bridging meeting. 
And we realized as we went for a walk together that we were holding two parts of the puzzle. All sides is focused on giving people the news from across the political spectrum. So people could see right, left and center, side by side and go, ooh, that's why people see things so differently. And what living room conversations is that ability to be in relationship with people that see things differently. And the reality of the science is we don't even hear people. We don't hear what they're saying when we don't trust them, when we don't have a relationship with them. Um, and that all sides in the living room conversations together are what's kind of magic, right? So John and I, had, John's been a partner at Living Room Conversations for years. We did a TED Talk together, I think in 2017, and then we did a Wisdom 2.0 talk a year or so after that together. Um, and he's just an amazing advocate. And of course, we're a left-right combination because he's from Kentucky and Appropriately enough, All Sides is a for-profit organization. Living Room Conversations, of course, is a not-for-profit. We are right and left in a very classic form. <laughs> and we really like each other. John is amazing. It's a great, uh, it is a great merge because one of the biggest things is people, whatever narrative they're, they're in, they're not hearing at all the others. And one of the great, ways I've been able to see people move out of a, a silo and, and get a willingness to get a broader perspective is when they're introduced to watching or seeing how their narrative is saying, telling them this and a different narrative that others are watching is telling them something totally different about the same issue. And then they begin to hopefully spark curiosity uh, to begin to think about media bias, their own bias, and how they and how those things interact to put us into silos. And hopefully, it sparks curiosity for people to rise above those biases to see a broader perspective. Well, it's natural for people to really appreciate hearing their own viewpoint reinforced. And that's what we seek in the news. When we have someone we really care about that sees things very differently, that brings it to us in a really deep way. My, you know, one of my dear friends in Utah, climate was not on his list of concerns when I first met him. And ultimately, because me and another friend of his, it was, and it was because he cared about me. And I became aware that he was concerned about being marginalized because of his faith. And I care about that because I care about him. And it, you know, the research shows that we are, generally making our decisions based on our emotions and then our brain is rationalizing that. That's right. And, you know, we just don't like believing that, but I really do. <laughs> I've, I've become totally convinced. It's hard for me often to articulate what my friends that I disagree with are saying. It really takes... I have to work harder. I, I watch my brain trying to take it in, trying to say, okay. It can be very confusing, but yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. Personal connections. Um, and that's where the internet, as you talked about much earlier, is this issue of, we do have the ability to connect, but the connections that we make online, if you don't know the person, like. Like I feel towards you and Steve because I had met personally. So now I don't feel any different coming online because there's a strong personal connection I feel towards both of you. But if I hadn't established that to come on online, it's very different. 
the connection you build with somebody that you just meet online and you and you don't have that opportunity to look into their eyes to feel their words you can hear it but you can't feel it and that's where the personal connection is lost when we think that these relationships that are started online and only are online are can be as deep as okay they are. so i have to have a difference with you on this one please because the thing that is so remarkable is in these small conversations across the country where people are meeting you know, for the first time and then having ongoing, there's one conversation group that I became part of and it's now on its fourth conversation. And I've never met any of these people in person, but I'm getting to know them in really by having meaningful conversations. So it, well, you know, the key, the key thing it's nice saying, though, in person. The key thing that you're saying though, is you're now into the second, third and fourth conversation. And that's what people, if they aren't sparked with the curiosity to continue it, they don't, they can't build it. You have to have that ongoing. And that's, that's the difference. What can create a deeper connection? Yes, but I, I am saying that it can be entirely by video and you can, because of the work I've done, I have some friendships that have been 95, 98% <laughs> remote and they are really dear friends. And I, so I don't want to diminish that at all. Good, no, I didn't, I didn't mean it to do that. Um, <laughs> So I'm glad you clarified that. Well, I've also been, you know, reporting on the fact that the impact of the conversations in video and in person is, you know, comes up the same, though they are different. Because if you have a local community, you have different ways that it connects. And if you have a virtual community, there that's necessarily you're not going to get together for dinner you're not going to hang out with the kids together uh you're not going to do a local project together but there are actually some natural projects you might do together yeah thank you well thank you so much joan uh for what you've been doing and for providing this uh this way for people who are curious and who are ready to rehumanize and are looking at uh, this reunion that we're talking about to actually get in, get involved. We have a link uh, after this interview, we'll have a link to, of course, Living Room Conversations. And we're encouraging people to take advantage of uh, the work and play that you've done over the last bunch of years. Thank you so much really right to spend time with you both and we should do it again we will <laughs> and i want to thank you joan uh, and, and you know our relationship is we've only really physically sat together i don't know four or five times maybe i mean we had a few up there and but i feel that strong connection that we've maintained through the internet and through the distances over the past nine years so again, thank you so much for what you're doing. And I wanna hope uh, that our guests have enjoyed this conversation. I hopefully uh, encourage you to go to livingroomconversations.org, uh, get involved, uh, we need you. Uh, and we're inviting you to, to follow us, please subscribe so Steve and I can continue our work and continue to pay our rent. And remember, from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields, it's a long journey to the more beautiful world our hearts know as possible. Let us go there together. Thank you so much. <laughs>